Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church of Costa Mesa's online worship service. I'm Pastor Sarah and it's my joy to welcome you here on our online space. I have a couple of announcements before we join in together in the liturgy or what's known as the work of the people. But I first want to start by telling you that I am today coming to you from uh, Bend, Oregon at First United Methodist Church of Bend. I'm grateful to Pastor Jen for letting me um, use this place and space to do work. Well, I've had to be up here for my Airstream trailer to get looked at. And so um, that's why I'm wearing a sweater. I know Costa Mesa, California does not require a sweater. It is gorgeous here and I'm so grateful for all the churches that have let me during this time uh, work from their sanctuaries and also I'm really lucky to see all these gorgeous stained glass windows, but let's get into the announcements. The first is that we have a couple ways that we can be involved in the community, whether that be that you're still doing that remotely or whether you're doing it with hands-on involvement because you've been uh, vaccinated. There's two ways that I would love for you to check out in the announcements. The first is the Love Costa Mesa event, which is May 15th. There are ways to do that remotely as well as ways to do that hands-on. So there is a link at the bottom of this that has more information on how to get involved in that. The second is the Project Hope Alliance still needs our help. So you can see all of that information um, for the Amazon uh, login, and that's a way that we provide needed items for um, students in um, in our area. And you can do that also remotely. So um, great way to stay connected. Speaking of staying connected, every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 a.m., we have a way that you can watch the service together at firstunitedcm.church.org online. Um, it is a great way for us, again, to be able, actually I think it's online.church. Look at the notes at the bottom. But point is, it's a great way for us to be able to chat while we're in the midst of watching the service together, and it's a way for us to be able to do community together. Following that, at 1030 on Facebook, we always gather together for announcements because for sure I've missed some, and also as a way for us to connect as a community through prayer time. There are other announcements for sure, but the final one I wanna give you here, as I know that we don't wanna take too much time doing announcements, is that uh, I wanted to let you know kind of where we're at as a community as we think through what it means to gather. The first one is this. We have got um, May 2nd for sure is gonna be an in-person service in our parking lot. We're gonna be sticking very tightly to our um, expectations of how to be safe uh, during COVID. So please check that out, make sure you register for that. And then in June, we're gonna start moving to meeting. The first one will be outside, and then we're gonna start gathering inside if safe, and we're just paying attention to the numbers. So make sure you're listening to all of the announcements. So my final announcement is actually about announcements. To stay connected, please uh, make sure you're following us on all the social media if you're a social media person. Um, you can do that first United CM across the board and then also you can um, make sure to uh, follow along on emails. If you're not part of our email chain, make sure you send us your email at um, the uh, address below which is info at costamesafirstumc.com. All right, those are all the announcements. So let's join together in this morning's call to worship. Good morning. I'm Stevie Gilpin, and I will be your uh, liturgist for the call to worship this morning. Liturgist, God is waiting for us, people, with a tender heart and a searching question. Liturgist, God is ready for us, people, with truth and wisdom from a deep well. Liturgist, God is blessing us. People with springs of living water. Liturgist, God is sending us people to sing, pray, and witness every day. All. God is here. Let the conversation begin. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. Will you join me now in singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness?
my compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings
Good morning. My name is Brian Tipton. I'll be reading this morning's scripture, which comes from the letter of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what love God has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know God. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When God is revealed, we will be like God for we will see God as God is. And all who have this hope in God purify themselves, just as God is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that God was revealed to take away sins, and in God there is no sin. No one who abides in God sins. No one who sins has either seen God or known God. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as God is righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. We are in the midst of a series on being seen. Um, and we've been talking about how we aren't just um, seen by eyes. In fact, the, the way that we engage the world, all the senses that we use, whether we are seeing or hearing or feeling, it's not just when we look at like the words that we use, it's not just about the physical nature of seeing someone, but there's also something else when we use that word that we mean. And also biblically as well, when we talk about this idea of being seen, it, it's layered. Last week, I used the example of my friend who is legally blind, yet I believe sees people so well. And when we hear people, we're not just talking about actually hearing people, right? There is this layered nuance. And so this morning, we're gonna talk about what it's like to be seen by God. And what does that mean that I'm seen by God? So let us pray and then we're gonna jump in. God is always with the words in my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gather here in this online space be acceptable to you, because you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oh, friends, I got to tell you, it is difficult to talk about being seen in a way that is honest and authentic without being honest and authentic about the pain of this week, of yet another murder of a, a black person pulled over by the police of Dante Wright. Whether an accident or not, it was still murder. And so it is going to take a long time for those in our community who are black to feel seen, to feel heard. For those of us who don't fit into that category, may I hope this invitation will be for us to listen and to participate and to be present to those around us. It just felt inauthentic for me to talk about God, seeing us without the reality that there is so much disparity in how people are seen here. So let us continue to be a place that challenges our own notions and our own um, understanding of things. And let us be in prayer, like I said, for peace and also for justice. Now this morning we are talking about being seen. And as I mentioned earlier, being seen is very layered, right? We can say that we see someone without actually seeing someone. We can be in the physical presence of someone and not know them, not comprehend them. We, again, engage the world with our senses. And oftentimes, we've heard this idea that God sees us. I remember when I was in college, I was in a Bible study where someone mentioned that when God looks at us, God doesn't see us, God sees Jesus. And I have to tell you, that theology seemed pretty great, right? So um, I, if I was awful, um, no worries, that when God looked upon me, God sees Jesus, and Jesus is pretty great, um, kind of the best. And so to look at me, I was sort of bypassed uh, because there was Jesus. And there was all these um, videos, maybe you saw them when you, if you grew up in this sort of a, an environment where, um, you know, God would be so angry at a person, but then Jesus would step in front of them and God no longer would regard their evil. But what does that say about God's ability to see us? or God's even desire to see us. Why would God, uh, the all-knowing, the divine being, create people that God could not even regard, beings that were so incapable of being good that to regard them um, meant that wrath would follow? 
See, if you follow out that logic, and I think sometimes uh, we do it without even knowing we're doing it, we think that, yeah, it's true, I am not worthy or I am not good enough to be seen by God. But it's sort of a funky reality. And, and then when we throw on this idea that God is our Father and our Father can't look at us because we're so terrible, what does that say about our very essence? We here at First United often like to remind people that they're already loved by God because I think we're sort of talking already a little bit about how this theology, this idea that we are not good enough to be even regarded by the divine is separating and making things a little bit more simple than maybe they should be. And it's making us not live into our divine being or purpose or who we actually are. God not wanting to see me because I'm so horrendous is, is a really unhelpful theology, if we're honest. So let's talk about how God does see us. If it isn't that we're so awful to be regarded because of our sinful nature, how does God see us? Well, this is a really interesting verse we are right here. And I think it gets to the heart of this whole thing. It kind of highlights the struggle that so many of us have. If we are seen as beloved or are we seen as sinners? Are we seen as wholly beloved or as we, are we seen as sinners? The scripture seems to say that yes, you are beloved children of God who are pure and righteous, but then it jumps into this sinning and lawlessness. So you are the beloved whom God is well pleased, but however, those of you who are sinning, there's lawlessness, right? It's this idea that author Scott Hosey says, you are children of God, you live in him and are so pure, and oh, by the way, if you keep sinning, you are no friend of God. So which is it? Is it that we are beloved and seen as beloved children, or is it that we're seen as potential sinners? It seems to be that the writing of both Paul and John are fighting against something that was happening that maybe we don't know the background of. A lot of scholarship talks about this idea that both Paul and John, when we look at their writing, we have to understand that a lot of folks were giving this idea almost that once you claimed the name of Jesus, there was this sort of righteousness cloak that you wore, however you lived your life here on this tangible earth did not matter. Hosey that I mentioned earlier suggested there's some sort of like Gnostic belief. And we've talked about Gnosticism before. It's this idea that as long as your spiritual thoughts and your secret knowledge of God are pure, what you do with this body of yours or how you behave doesn't matter because it's all about the mind and right thought. And so it makes sense why Paul and John both want to proclaim this gospel good news that God sees you as beloved, but want to put like a little disclaimer, but that doesn't mean do whatever you want. It's this fundamental misunderstanding of the effect of God's lavish love upon us. The thing is though, we often try to see God and therefore see ourselves in sort of this idea that God is sort of like the human condition, but better. Hosey quoted theologian Laura Smith. Too often we think that what it means to ponder something like goodness when it applies to God is that we look at human goodness and our definitions of goodness, and then we just make them bigger. We are good, God is good. But in reality, Smith notes, goodness in God is not just human goodness magnified, but is of a totally different quality. When we share in God's goodness, we are sharing in the fruit of the spirit. It means something quite different, our characteristics change. Our ability of being seen changes when we are in this character of God. But notice this. If we miss out on this ending bit here, this little end of the verses, when it says the problem, oop, I'm looking at the wrong part. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as God is righteous. Ooh, everyone who does what is right is righteous. It's this interesting idea that maybe God sees us in totality for our actions, for who we are, who we've been, who we desire to be, our fullness. Being seen by God is being fully seen and fully sec like accepted beyond words, just beyond action, beyond even 
uh, the notion of, of being seen as good or bad. And I think these are huge ideas because sometimes that's scary and sometimes it's life giving. I think we're struggling here. When we look at this, when we hear these scriptures, we have to hear this as writers who are struggling with the notion, what if I'm all seen as good? Will I still be good? Let me say that again. What if I'm seen as good? Will I still be good? Will my actions, if I'm already accepted, will I continue to be good? Will the people continue to be good or will they just see themselves as once saved, always saved, doesn't matter what we really do. To be fully seen by God and to be seen as beloved, will that cause our actions to be ungodly or unrighteous? Well, the truth is, is when I looked up a bunch of uh, psychological studies, friends, because um, you guys don't know I'm a nerd, so I went on to psychology today again. Um, I started reading all these articles about um, therapy that helps people learn to be seen. So what that means is people who have felt like they haven't been um, acknowledged for who they really are, there's all different reasons why that is. What they discovered is those people who are fully seen and can accept themselves as fully seen start to fully see other people. So if we can see ourselves as fully seen and loved by God, not despite of, and sometimes because of, but, but just in this capacity that is so much bigger than our human understanding, then we start to learn to be able to see other people. Being seen by God means seeing other people. So one of the therapists I read had this list and I thought this was helpful. These are simple lists of things that we can do to see other people. So if we can accept this belovedness that we have, how do we kind of pass that on to others? Because the interesting thing too is that it is a circle that once we start to love and see others, we start to be able to love and see ourselves, but we need to love and see ourselves to be able to love and see others. And that requires in many ways for us to acknowledge our belovedness. So here are some simple tips. Learn and remember the names of people you interact with frequently. If I can do something simple to help someone else feel seen and get their needs met, I'm gonna do it. For instance, this author gives the example of when she's driving, she makes room for people who has their blinker on so they can switch in the lane, it doesn't hurt me. And what it's really saying to them is, I see you and I understand and respect that you are important. Those of us who live in Southern California, this is doubly important. Third, she committed to wanting to stay off her phone when she was with others. There are a few things as invalidating as someone taking messages from other people. The next one was eye contact and smiling with people. Now I know we have masks on, but actually regarding people, for people who feel very isolated. Um, so now more than other, any time to acknowledge someone else's presence, to engage people in eye contact if you're comfortable with it. And the last one, and I think this important one, is that this person committed to continuing supporting the efforts of people and groups who don't feel seen, including Black Lives Matter, because they deserve to be seen, because they do matter. This author, this psychiatrist, her um, notion was that being seen is the most powerful and important phrase in the English language. And what if it was one of the gifts that we give each other because we have had the divine sight. We have been gazed upon and not found to be wanting. See, I know we hear this scripture and it sounds as if it's like, okay, yes, you are fully beloved, but, but instead, what if we read it with the eyes of, these are people who are trying to respond to the notion that some folks are, are giving this idea that if you are fully loved and fully seen, that then you can do whatever you want. And they wanna make sure that doesn't happen. And so they're swooping in with, but don't forget to. Friends, I think we've, we've sort of missed the mark. We've sort of missed the biggest part of the good news. And the good news is you're already loved by God. You're already seen by God. And it's an invitation to live out this loving sight and to start to lovingly see those around you. I loved these very simple examples that the psychiatrist gave because as I read them, originally I wasn't gonna put them in the sermon, but I realized that those are absolutely little tiny revolutions, as I like to call it, of ways that you can change the world just by changing somebody's day. 
just by learning to see and to be seen. So friends, will you pray with me? God, so often we are afraid of your gaze because we have been told over and over again that you don't wanna look upon us, not our true selves. What a good news message it is that we are the beloved with whom you are well pleased and that when you see us, you see us. Thank you for this message, this reminder. Will you continue to whisper it in our ear so that we can do the same for others? Amen.
All right, friends, will you join me in receiving the benediction? If you'll open your hands or, or however you want to when you're at home, we do this as a way of, as a stance of saying that we are open to what is next, perhaps that we are open to being fully seen. So will we receive these words? Now, may we go about our daily lives looking for places to see others. And may we be seen ourselves. And may we know that once being gazed upon, we are loved. And so we are free to love others. Have a blessed week, friends. Amen.